Father God, I thank you for this day, for the gift of life. Searched all over and couldn't find nobody greater than you. And without question, our God is an awesome God. And so, God, I pray now that you would bless the person whose hand I hold. Show yourself strong on behalf of my brother, my sister. And I pray now, God, that you would save and heal, strengthen, even deliver in this worship experience. And my prayer, God, is that you get all the glory because you're in a class by yourself. But let fresh anointing, God, be upon our lives. And I ask as always that you'll let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together and let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. Let's just continue to allow those in the concourse to join us in the sanctuary. And while they are joining us, uh, let's appreciatively applaud our minister of music, uh, Michelle, and the high praise choir. Come on, let's thank God for the high praise choir. Thank God, thank God, thank God for the high praise choir. Amen. Thank God for them. Michelle Randolph is with child and she's down to the weeks. She's down to the we five weeks. Michelle, you're starting to make me nervous. Amen. I told her we're not going to have that baby here on Sunday morning. Amen. 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 All right. So you make me a little nervous. Amen. When we get down to the last week, you're going to direct from home. Amen. I'm going to speak to you on streaming faith. Amen. Because we are not going to have that child in here on a Sunday morning. Amen. God be praised. Come on. Thank God for our music ministry. Amen. God be praised. Amen. Um, Sister Angie's... Uh, Asia, congratulations on your recent achievement. Pastor got the email, very, very proud of you. Thank God for you. And I see you with your blue glasses matching your blue flower. You got it going on. Amen. You got it going on. Amen. I see you. I know that ain't Kentucky blue. You just putting on a little fashion. Amen. I know you are a UofL fan, but congratulations. Pastor's very proud of you. Amen. Um, as we prepare to receive the word of God, I'm going to ask that you would stand with me as I prepare to read the scripture text that's going to serve as the basis for the lesson today. And while you're standing, if you'll take your Bible, I pray that you have a Bible with you. If you'll take your Bible in your hand and hold it up in the air. Everyone take your Bible in your hand, hold it in the air. Just repeat after me, God, God. I thank you for your word. word. Alright. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. I want to read verses 1 through 10. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 1 through 10. Beginning with the first verse. The word of God reads like this. Are you there? Hebrews chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Some of us are still on our way. That's all right. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. The word of God reads like this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem meaning king of peace without father without mother without genealogy having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like the son of God remains a priest continually now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. 
And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I prepare to teach the word of God, um, you may want to secure this CD in the future. And so we're going to put a tag on this text so that you'll have a reference by which to be able to uh, get this um, teaching again that you might listen to it and it might bless you um, over and over again. And so as we put a tag on this text, if you'll just turn to the person beside you and tell them, God knows I'm grateful. Come on, look at somebody else. Put some emphasis behind it. Tell them, say, God knows I'm grateful. So when you want to secure this CD for future reference, that's how you will refer to it. I want the lesson entitled, God knows I'm grateful. As I begin this teaching and as I share this message with you today, I want to begin by saying that the epistle to the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is a wonderful epistle of the Bible to read and to study because it has much to say to us about our spiritual formation and our growth as disciples in the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews uh, writes with the theme of the superiority of Jesus Christ. That is to say that Jesus Christ is superior to everything that we see in the Old Testament. He sets the stage for this thesis in the opening chapter and the first uh, verse of this epistle when the writer says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. This is to say that the writer is putting emphasis on the fact that Jesus Christ is the highest revelation that we have ever received of God in the world. In fact, he is saying that everything that God has said, everything God is saying, and everything God will ever say, he's already said in the person of Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ is God's supreme revelation. When you read the earlier chapters in this epistle to the Hebrews, uh, the writer has already substantiated the fact that Jesus is greater than Moses, he's greater than the law, he's greater than angels, he's greater than the old covenant. He has established the fact that Jesus Christ is our blessed Redeemer. That God in Christ has done something for us for which we could have never done for ourselves. You and I gathered here today as Christians are who we are, not by our goodness, but by God's grace. And you ought to give God a praise for that. Because we are saved by the finished work of Christ on the cross. It is what God has intentionally did to redeem us from the degradation of our sin and shame. And now having established the fact that Jesus is our blessed redeemer, in chapter 7 the writer does a thorough and in-depth presentation that not only is Jesus our blessed redeemer but he's also our great high priest he's going to talk about the fact that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek he's writing to a second generation of Christian believers 
When I say he's writing to a second generation of Christian believers, this means, beloved, that he's writing to people who had never seen Jesus in the flesh. He's writing to people who are now making a commitment to Christ like you and I, though they did not live in the time that Christ was on earth. So they are second generation believers. These persons, these early Christians are people who are having to deal with pressure, with pain, with persecution and pathos. And the reason why they're dealing with pressure is because these are Jewish Christians. They are persons who have, out of their allegiance to Christ, dared to move from the old Judaistic expression of their faith to embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and now become a part of the Christian movement. And because they dared to move from Judaism and to believe the progressive revelation of God in Christ, the pressure is that now they have been ostracized from the synagogue and in many cases they have been cut off in their community even from family and loved ones because they have dared to put their faith in Jesus Christ who was crucified on a cross, buried and resurrected from the grave but there are still those who question the authenticity of the person of Christ. Join us at this year's Summer Revival, July 22nd to the 24th, with special guest, Dr. Gina Stewart. I'm not going to go by what I see. I'm going to go by what I know. That all things work together for the good of them that love God. Dr. Wanda Frazier Parker. Who sits high and he sees and knows the conspiracy that's been conspired to get you out of his plan. He's able to bring us out. Say yeah. Say yes. Say yes. Oh yes. Take it back. Cheryl Brady. Take your joy back. Take your peace back. Take your marriage back. Take your children back. If you're watching me by television, God said take it all, take it all back. As you've heard, these worship services will be filled with powerful preaching from some of God's best and leading anointed women of the gospel. Don't miss out on these powerful, impactful three days of praise and worship. The persecution that they're facing and the pain and the pathos has to do with the fact that their very lives are now being threatened by Roman emperor Caesars like uh, Nero and Domitian who was taking Christians and then causing them to become martyrs for the faith. People were literally losing their lives because of their confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Because in the first century, it was expected that one would say Curios Caesar and not Curios Christ. So the writer of Hebrews wants these Christians, these, these second generation believers to understand, on one hand, Jesus Christ is your blessed redeemer. On another hand, Jesus Christ is not only your blessed redeemer, but he's also your great high priest. He wants to understand that this is something that you can't take for granted because as your blessed redeemer, as your savior, he's the one who has secured your salvation. But because he's also your great high priest, he's not only the one who has secured your salvation, he's also the one who is sustaining your life. Because you see, if indeed I'm having to deal with pressure and persecution and pain and pathos, what I want to know is how am I going to hold on to my faith in Jesus Christ when I'm catching hell on every hand? What I want to know is that if I am a committed Christian, does it really pay to serve Jesus? What I want to know is how am I still going to praise God when I got pain in my life and how do I continue to exercise my commitment to Lord Jesus when I'm not sure about my future and that's not only the question of the people in the text that's your question and that's my question it's one thing to go to church on Sunday but how do you live between the Sundays 
uh, uh, if I'm going to be an, uh, a Christian and a child of God, I understand that I got to deal with spiritual warfare. I understand that the devil has me on the hit list. But what I want to know is how can I come to church and still have a hallelujah if I'm dealing with hell in my house? Is it possible to catch hell and still give God a praise? And I ain't faking it, but it really has meaning in my life. And the writer is trying to tell us that the God who saves you is the God that can sustain you. That Jesus Christ has not only ministered to you on a cross, but he's still ministering to you right now. And that you don't have to lose your ever living mind. You don't have to have a nervous breakdown. You can still come to church and give God some glory when you know that if you're going through it, you ain't going through it by yourself. Tap somebody and say, you got a God on your side. Look at somebody else and say, pastor may be teaching, but I declare I'm about to holler. He's trying, he's trying to help them understand the fullness of who Jesus is. And you and I need to understand the fullness of of who he is. See, 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 there's a whole lot of folk come to church, speak his name, but don't know who he is. A, a whole lot of folk carry the title Christian, but they don't live with power because they have not appropriated. Oh, I'm about to shout myself. They have not appropriated what it really means to have Christ in you, the hope of glory. The writer, the writer, the, the writer in Hebrews chapter 7, he's going to do Angie a thorough presentation of who Jesus is as our great high priest. But he doesn't start Angie in chapter 7. He actually starts dealing with this in chapter 4. He's already established the fact that Jesus is greater than anything you'll ever see in the Old Testament records. He's established the fact that Jesus is our blessed Savior who has redeemed us from our sins. But then Deborah in chapter 4, the writer ben goes on to say, but now we have a high priest who has been tested and tried in every way that we could ever be tested and tried in life, and he didn't flunk. And therefore, he identifies with our infirmities. He shares in with our suffering. Therefore, he bids you to come to the throne of grace with boldness and with confidence, knowing that you can find grace and mercy in a time of need. And then he starts in chapter 5, really talking about Jesus as one who comes after the order of Melchizedek. But as he's getting ready to go deep into this thing, he pauses Sylvia parenthetically because he understands that there are some people in this early church who have gotten somewhat stuck and stayed in their spiritual development. And he says, I better pause this thing for a minute because I'm trying to help you all to understand that Jesus is not only a savior, but he's your great high priest. But I'm getting ready to go so deep in this thing, I better pause parenthetically because I think some of y'all going to miss it because you're not where you need to be to receive it. So, at the, so, so in chapter 5, he says to them, he says, listen, he says, you ought to be at a place right now where you're teaching others, but you still need to be taught yourself. He, he says you ought to be eating meat, but you're still on pablum. You, you still need a, a bottle in your mouth like a baby, when in fact you are a grown adult. And, and then when he gets to chapter 6, he keeps pressing his case and he says, you need to move on from the elementary principles of Christ. And he challenges them to go on to perfection. He says, it's time for you to move on. Tell somebody you got to keep moving. And he's given them, he's given them, he says, this is what you got to move on from. He's got, he says, you got to move forward from the foundation. That means the basics of, of what it means to be a child of God. <clears throat> he says, from repentance, from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. In other words, my dears, what we are hearing here is that these early believers in Christ, listen to this, 
they were in a new members class. They, they were like, you know, the class we have here at the church on discipleship development that new people have to go through. That's the class they were in. And, and they were studying, reader, catechism. And the catechistical study was this. They had three co courses, one in, in soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, pneumatology, the doctrine of the spirit of God, and eschatology, the doctrine on last things. Let me show it to you. I ain't making this up. In chapter 6, uh, he says that they are to move from the foundation of repentance, of dead works, and of faith toward God. That's the class on soteriology, a class on salvation. He says the next class is on, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands. That's the class on pneumatology, a do, the class on the doctrine of the Spirit of God. He says then they had a third class on the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. That's the class on eschatology, a class on when you go to heaven. They were in a new members class, a class on discipleship development, and it was catechism, Angie. They were going through three major theological biblical studies in the class you learned about soteriology you learned about what it means to be saved and how you got saved then they gave you a class on pneumatology what it means to have the spirit of God to be resident in your life then they had a class on eschatology you ain't gonna live always so what does it mean to die and go to heaven but the writer says you can't stay in new members class all your life at some point, you're supposed to graduate and get out of kindergarten and keep moving. Because there's some serious stuff I got to tell you. There's some things you got to learn that ain't surface level. It's deep and it's going to impact the way you live your life. And then after he moves them on from that, then he says, okay, let me pick it back up. And then chapter 7, then he starts again in a thorough way talking about who Jesus is as our great high priest. And the writer says that Jesus Christ is a great high priest. He says, after the order of Melchizedek. And he, he introduces Melchizedek. He says to them, he says, now you need to understand who he is as an Old Testament figure. He says he's the one who Abraham had an encounter with after Abraham had defeated four Canaanite kings when he rescued and recovered his nephew Lot. He says it was Melchizedek who Abraham met and, and Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth, that is a tithe of everything that he had gained from the victory. Melchizedek, the name Melchizedek means righteousness and king of Salem means peace. The writer says that Melchizedek had neither mother nor father nor beginning nor ending of days. And he says that Jesus came after the order of Melchizedek. Now, now, there are some Old Testament scholars who would want to say that Melchizedek in the Old Testament, in this episode between him and Abraham, that Melchizedek, listen, was a pre-incarnate uh, revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, and they will say that because the Bible says that Melchizedek had neither mother nor father, neither beginning nor ending of days. But I would take a different posture along with other Old Testament and New Testament scholars in that Melchizedek was not a early incarnation of Jesus Christ. But that Melchizedek was a human being. He was a man who lived born of a woman. Uh, he was not the Christ. He was a type. A type representing what Christ would be like when he came. See, Reverend Rowan, the revelation of Scripture is not always what the Bible says. Sometimes the revelation is in what the Bible doesn't say. Sometimes the revelation is in the silence of the Scriptures. So we don't have to press the Scripture to say something that it doesn't say. You see, so in, in, the, in, 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 in the Bible, in, in the Old Testament, we read about Melchizedek, it doesn't tell us certain things. It doesn't tell us who his mama was. It doesn't tell us who his daddy was. It doesn't tell us where he came from. It doesn't tell us where he's going. Tonight, when you get a chance as a follow-up to this lesson this morning, read Genesis chapter 14. 
And when you read Genesis chapter 14, you're going to read about the story of the encounter that Abraham had with Melchizedek after he had the victory over these four Canaanite kings. But this is what you're also going to find out. When you read Genesis 14, guess what? You ain't going to read nothing about Melchizedek before Genesis 14. Let me tell you what else you're going to find out. You ain't going to read nothing else after Genesis 14 about Melchizedek because he ain't mentioned before or after nowhere else in the Bible. And the reason why it's given to us like that is Melchizedek is simply a type. He is a metaphor of the Christ who is to come. Because while his name means righteousness and while king of Salem means peace, uh, he did not offer righteousness and he couldn't give anybody any ultimate peace. And Melchizedek, whose name means righteousness, he's, and he's also uh, 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 the king of Salem, he functioned both in the office of king and priest. But you see, in the Old Testament times, one could not hold an office both as king and priest. So that was something unique about Melchizedek. And then he had neither mother nor father nor in the beginning or end in the days because we just don't know about it, although he had it. But it is a wonderful type and metaphor of Jesus to come because you know that in Jesus Christ, righteousness and peace have kissed. And you know that Jesus is one who has neither mother nor father nor beginning nor ending of days because you know that Jesus' existence did not start in a manger in Bethlehem. You know he is without question the pre-incarnate Christ. That's why the Gospel of John says in the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the gospel says, and the word became flesh and we beheld his glory. The glories of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. He is the God manifested in the flesh. And where the writer is going with is this, <coughs> where he's going with this is that Jesus did not come after the order of Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. Because to come after that order, that lineage, you had to have come out of the tribe of Levi. But Jesus didn't come through the tribe of Levi. He came through the tribe of Judah. That wasn't the tribe for the Levites, that was the praise team tribe. If you wish to purchase a copy of today's message, call 502-459-5578, extension 131. Leave your name, number, and a title of today's message.